Um, we're starting this series called Remnant. How, what's, does anybody know what a remnant is? What is a remnant, by the way? Piece of, a little piece of fabric, right? So some, you know, uh, just not, not, not the whole fabric, right? But it's a piece. Well, that's uh, why I call this series Remnant, because we're just studying a piece of the story that comes to us from the Old Testament, particularly um, as God interacts with his people over some pretty serious some pretty serious issues. And um, I want to start by sharing a little bit about how many of you have ever heard the, the name Exxon Valdez? Anybody familiar with that, that phrase? Some of y'all who are a little bit younger, you've never heard of Exxon Valdez, okay? Laura, you've probably never have heard of it because you're like a teenager, so you probably never heard of it. But the Exxon Valdez um, was the original name of an oil tanker that was owned by what was known as the Exxon Corporation. And what happened was on March 21st, 1989, there was this oil spill. As you can see there in one of the pictures, there's this oil spill in uh, Washington, the state of Washington, that hit Prince William's Sound. Does that sound familiar to you? Prince William Sound. And spilled an estimated 19.8 million U.S. gallons of crude oil. Uh, it's carrying about 1.26 million barrels or about 53 million barrels of oil at the time it ran around. In other words, this is a huge tanker and it spilled, it spilled a lot, but it didn't spill at all. The oil eventually covered 11,000 square miles of ocean and the best estimate include as many as they think somewhere between 250 to half a million seabirds were affected, a thousand sea otters, there were 12 river otters, 13 harbor seals, 250 bald eagles, 22 orcas, as well as the destruction of billions of salmon and herring eggs. It's been recorded as one of the largest oil spills in U.S. history, one of the largest ecological disasters. However, due to a thorough cleanup, there was little visual evidence that remained a year later. A team of scientists at the University of North Carolina found out that the effects are lasting a little bit longer than they thought, yet the team estimated that it would take up to 30 years for the shoreline to recover. 30 years from one oil spill. Let me show you something else. How many of you have ever heard of Mount St. Helens? Heard of Mount St. Helens? Yeah. Mount St. Helens is located also in the state of Washington. Washington has some problems with some things. State of Washington, right? It's a mountain in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States. It's actually part of what they call the Ring of Fire, right? There's this rim of mountains that stretch from the, uh, from the far west side of the Pacific Ocean up and around and come down through the United States. And it's, this mountain's part of the Cascade Volcanic Region. And within this Ring of Fire, there are 160 active not dormant, active volcanoes. So sometimes, like, we look at pictures at when we lived in, in uh, Seattle, we always looked at pictures of Mount Rainier, and I always thought, oh, that's just a beautiful, beautiful mountain. That's an active volcano, right? It's an active volcano. Well, so was Mount St. Helens. And on May 18th, 1980, there was the deadliest and most economically destructive volcanic event in the history of the United States. 57 people were killed, 250 homes were destroyed, 47 bridges, 15 miles of railway, and 185 miles of highway were destroyed. The eruption caused a massive, what they called, debris avalanche. It reduced the elevation of the mountain. The mountain actually became smaller because of the, the volcanic eruption. It went from being a mountain of almost 10,000 feet to just under 8,500 feet high. And there's this uh, mile-wide, what they call, horseshoe crater. The debris avalanche was up to 0 0.7 cubic miles in volume. In other words, that's kind of how deep the stuff that it pushed was. But less than 35 years later, the area that was devastated by this powerful, incredibly destructive event, it's recovered. That's what Mount St. Helens looks like today. If you were to look at that picture on the lower, the lower side there, destruction has now recovered. 
made this incredible turnaround. Incredible disasters in fairly recent history that have incredibly bad outcomes. <laughs> but, you know, the power of our planet is nothing compared to the power of the creator of the planet. God's power to use disasters often complete his perfect plan. Actually, that's what the entire three chapters of the book of Joel are all about. God, through the prophet Joel, he explains what his plans are for the nation of Israel, and he gives us a glimpse of his ultimate plan for humanity. And so very briefly this morning, we're going to begin this brief foray through this series called Remnant. Take a look at Joel and see how God explains very first that the land's going to be ravaged, then it's going to be restored. And that's in Joel chapter 1 and 2 is where we kind of get the setup for this. The book of Joel begins by asking a series of what we would call rhetorical questions. And the first question that's asked by the prophet Joel comes from Joel chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. We read these words from the prophet Joel. Has anything like this ever happened before? Tell our children, let it be told to our grandchildren and their children too. The point of the question is really quite simple. Joel is in effect asking, can you think of a time that has ever been worse than what is about to happen? It's about to be so bad, says Joel, that this is something that you will want your children and your grandchildren to be told about. Whatever it is, it's very, very serious. We don't have to wait too long to find out what it is. Because all we do is go to the next verse, verse 4. Swarm after swarm of locusts have attacked our crops, eating everything in sight. The land of Judah, the southern half of the ancient nation of Israel, is about to be completely ravaged by swarming, gnawing, creeping, and stripping locusts. Kind of like cicadas over in Illinois. I didn't feel bad for those people. But locusts are worse than cicadas. They're about to make the nation barren. Now, frankly, I've read about that. And although it sounds really bad to me, I have no idea that the damage that locusts can do. I suppose it's really bad. I mean, it's in God's word, in the Bible. But what does that, well, I mean, what does it really mean that locusts are coming? Well, there was an observer who wrote about a particular locust swarm that struck in our nation here, uh, over 100 years ago. This is what he said. The grasshoppers ate and ate. They devoured everything from barley to buckwheat to spruce and tobacco. The locusts even ate blankets that women had put over the crops to protect them. A few records report that the locusts were eating fence posts, leather, dead animals, and sheep wool. Cannibalism among the locusts was also observed. One common comment was that the grasshoppers ate everything except my mortgage. The damage is serious. And for some reason, God, God is the one sending the locusts. We are in trouble. Soon the Lord, all-powerful, will bring disaster. God is going to bring disaster on his very own people, and it will be so bad that on top of it, after the locusts come, we read that there's a powerful nation with countless troops that's going to come. There's also going to be a severe famine. Are you getting the picture here? It's, it's going to be really bad. Joel tells the nation there'll be no grain, no grapes, no olives, just shriveled and dried up farms and vineyards. But why? Why? Why is the nation being ravaged this way? What is the problem? What is God trying to tell his people? Simply this. God is calling his people to change their ways and repent. The nation is told to cry out to God, mourn, you priest who serve at the altar of my God. Spend your days and nights wearing sackcloth. Offerings of grain and wine are no longer brought to the Lord's temple. Tell the leaders and the people to come together at the temple. Order them to go without eating and to pray sincerely. But get this. <laughs> The really frightening part on top of all of this in the second chapter of Joel is that God's judgment is imminent. Now, what did I just tell you? 
All that stuff happened, and we're still not facing God's judgment, according to Joel. Here's what Joel writes in chapter 2 of Joel. The Lord God leads this army of countless troops. They obey his command. The day of his judgment is so terrible that no one can stand it. The answer to all of this is repentance. God's call to radical change. When we turn our backs and completely on our sin, when we fully surrender to God, as the call here is, it's what Pastor Bryce just read this morning. We're supposed to change our lives, not just our clothes. Come back to God, your God. And here's why. God is kind and merciful. He takes a deep breath and puts up with a lot. This most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophe. Who knows? Maybe he'll do it now. Maybe he'll turn around and show pity. Maybe when all is said and done, there'll be blessings full and robust from your God. You know, we probably all know people like this. I mean, perhaps we, we're sometimes guilty of this ourselves, where we simply go through the motions of change, you know, trying to make it look as though we are trying to line up with God's plans for our lives. Until very recently, the only way to study how a caterpillar changed into a butterfly was to cut open the chrysalis to x-ray it, but that often met with fatal results to the caterpillar. There was a recent issue of National, Graphic, National Geographic that reported on this thing called micro CT scans that shows how this metamorphosis, this change takes place. Metaf metamorphosis is radical change, in, not just in form, but also in function. And many animals, they go through this process. You know, frogs do it, sea urchin, wasps, beetles, but most of us, we get our idea from metamorphosis from caterpillars that become what? Butterflies, right? Yet scientists are just only recently beginning to grasp the miracle of what goes on in a chrysalis. New research shows that this insect's makeover is a mix of destruction of old ways of being and thinking combined with a brand new ways of being and thinking. The article notes that certain cells die, body parts atrophy. Meanwhile, other cells in place since birth rapidly expand. The adult emerges completely remodeled. It's capable of flight, possessing a completely rewired brain. And that's what Joel is calling Judah to. That's what God is calling us to, in a very real sense, to be rewired from the inside out, radical change, radical repentance. And God promises, God promises that when we, just like the nation of Judah, repent, he will do marvelous things. In the case of Judah, in Joel chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord will show concern for the land. He will take pity on his people. Also, the Lord says, I sent a great army of locusts to attack you. They included common locusts, giant locusts, young locusts, and other locusts. But read this next part. I will make up for the years they ate your crops. You will have plenty to eat. It will satisfy you completely. Then you will praise me. I am the Lord your God. I've done wonderful miracles for you. And so now, here in the book of Joel, talking about this remnant, God begins to lay out a promise that will not only bring restoration to the nation of Judah, but actually, God gives a sneak peek regarding salvation for the world, Jews and Gentiles, a coming teacher of righteousness. Joel chapter 2, verse 23, for many years, biblical scholars have rightly said it's a prophecy concerning the coming of Jesus. As a matter of fact, one translation into English that comes the closest 
to what was really written in the original language of Hebrew comes to us from the message translation. This is what we read there. Children of Zion, celebrate. Be glad in your God. He is giving you a teacher to train you to live right. The coming of Jesus Christ would be the ultimate deliverance for the nation of Judah, for the world. No more pain, only joy. Rejoicing would be, the, would be what would be in effect. But that promise, that promise, this promise from God, it comes with a price tag. Our lives in complete surrender to him. Because God promises to those who love him this, that there's a deliverance to come, but there's also a day of destiny. Joel writes this, Later I will give my spirit to everyone. This might sound familiar to you if you've ever read the book of Acts. Later I will give my spirit to everyone. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions in those days. I will even give my spirit to my servants, both men and women. Joel says God is about to do something completely new and different. This coming teacher that's promised in verse Joel 2.23, it's going to make it possible for everyone, no matter what your ethnicity, Jew or Gentile, non-Jew, no matter what your age, old or young, no matter your gender, son or daughter, you're going to have the opportunity to know the God of Israel. God keeps that promise in Acts chapter 2 with the birth of the church. Peter quotes the prophet Joel, verses 18 through 21 of chapter 2 here in Joel. Salvation, deliverance, is now available to everyone. We do not have to face the possibility of answering for rejection of Jesus. Amazingly, Joel continues on. He describes what it's going to be like for those who reject God's call to repentance. The, the warning signs that Joel describes in his book are things like blood and fire, billowing smoke. These aren't good signs. But God is warning us all what to do. So the question comes from this chapter in Joel, what do you do? Well, how do you handle warning signs? Did you know six in 10 Gen Zers and millennials have a complicated relationship with their cars? Oh, yeah. See, there was a survey that was done. Gen Zers are folks who were born between 1997 and 2012. And millennials are those who were born between 1981 and 1996. And car owner records reveal that it takes an average of eight warning lights for them to schedule vehicle maintenance. However, however, one in four tend to disregard and continue driving with broken speakers or radio, excessive emissions, low tire pressure, light, oil change, or scratches on their vehicle's body or windshield. And two out of three say they're okay with their car not being up to par as long as it passes a state license safety test. On average, on average, it takes five breakdowns for Gen Zers and millennials to get a new car. People stop driving their car and get a new one when their upkeep surpasses their budget or there are too many strange sounds or smells, too many parts to be replaced or too much of it's being held together by duct tape. They don't want to take the time to ensure the safety and well-being of their vehicle. So here's a question for you this morning. As we continue to kind of get a feel for what God is telling the nation. <laughs> Maybe your car doesn't have any warning signs, but what is God trying to tell you? That, that's what's happening here in the book of Joel. God is trying to tell the nation of Israel, and also you and I. He's trying to tell us something. He's speaking to you today about what he wants from your life. Just like he wanted the nation of Israel to turn their lives around to him right now. What does he want from you? As we look through this final part 
of the book of Joel, what does God want us to take away from encountering this today? Frankly, I believe God wants us to understand that eventually, just like for the nation of Israel, there was judgment. Remember that army of locusts that I talked about, the famine? There's going to be judgment for all of us. Joel chapter 3, verse 2 says, Then in Judgment Valley, I will bring together the nations that scattered by people Israel everywhere in the world, and I will bring charges against those nations. Crowds fill Decision Valley. The Judgment Day of the Lord will soon be here. No light from the sun or moon and stars no longer shine. Every one of us has this date with destiny. That's what God determined thousands of years ago. The problem is, even as God tries to get our attention so that we might begin to understand that this day is coming, we ignore him. <laughs> we tend to shut him out, thinking that somehow we'll escape this, this coming judgment. But there's a question, another question that comes from the book of Joel that I think it would be wise for you to answer today. Are you ready for that judgment? Or are you and I like those that the apostle Peter describes in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4? Peter says that folks are going around saying, where is this return, he promised, talking about Jesus coming back. Where is this return, he promised. Everything goes on the same way it has since our people of long ago died. In fact, it's continued that way since God first created everything. See, the prophet Joel makes it clear. God's actually giving us a heads up. Does anybody know what a heads up is? Yeah, yeah God's kind of saying, hey, just so you know, just so you're prepared. And Peter confirms something that you need to know. Again, from this same chapter in 1 Peter, he answers that, that question that is posed. See, the Lord is not slow to keep his promise. He is not slow in the way some people understand it. He is patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. Instead, instead, he wants all people to turn away from their sins. And truly, this is the bottom line. Joel makes it clear that God is trying to tell us something. Not only ancient Israel, but you and me as well. What's he trying to say to you today? There was a book written by a guy named Mark Batterson regarding something that happened on December 26th, 2004. That stays in my mind, that date. That was a boxing day in Canada and England, 2004. That's actually when the third largest earthquake ever recorded occurred deep beneath the Indian Ocean. Does anybody remember hearing about that earthquake and the subsequent tsunami? Devastating, just devastating. It registered 9.1 magnitude on the Richter scale. The shock waves produce tsunami waves more than 900 feet in height. Get that. That's a 10-story building wave traveling 500 miles per hour, reaching a radius of 3,000 miles. The deadliest tsunami in history claimed 230 thousand lives. But there was one group of people living right in its path who miraculously survived without a single casualty. The Moken. Has anybody ever heard of the Moken people? The Moken people are an Austronesian ethnic group that live actually in the open seas from birth until their death. And they have handcrafted wooden boats called Kabang. They function as houseboats for these folks who are basically a little bit like sea gypsies. 
And Moken children learn to swim before they learn to walk. I was just talking with someone this morning about how Canadian kids, before they learn how to walk, they learn how to skate. But Moken, Moken children learn to swim before they can learn to walk. They can see twice as clearly underwater as those of us who live on land. And if there were an underwater breath-holding contest, it would be no contest. But it wasn't any of these skills that saved them from the tsunami. What saved them was their intimacy with the ocean. The Moken knew its moods, its messages, better than any oceanographer reading ocean waves the way that you and I read street signs. On the day of the earthquake, there was an amateur photographer from Bangkok who was taking pictures of the Moken when she became concerned by what she saw. As the sea started to recede, many of the Moken began to cry. They knew what was about to happen. They recognized that the birds had stopped chirping. The cicadas had gone silent. The elephants were headed toward higher ground and the dolphins were swimming further out to sea. Fishermen in the same vicinity as the Moken were blindsided by the tsunami. No one survived. They were collecting squid, said one Moken survivor. They didn't know how to look. The waves and the birds and the cicadas and the elephants and the dolphins were speaking to these Burmese fishermen, but sadly, they did not know how to listen. A local anthropologist who speaks Moken said, the water receded very fast, and one wave, one small wave, came. So they recognized that this is not ordinary. My friends, what do you see? Do you recognize what God is telling you? What about our friends, our family? Do they see? And if they don't, perhaps it's up to us to be the ones to help them recognize and to hear from God. That's what the book of Joel is called the nation of Israel to. It's what we are being called to. What is God saying to you right now? I'm going to ask you if you would, would you just bow your heads and pray with me this morning? God, we are so grateful that you love us so much. Lord, you are not a silent God. No, you speak to us very clearly about what it is that you expect, what it is that you want, what it is that you have for us, what you planned for us. God, may we be a people who listen, who pay attention. May we not miss the signs. Help us to be especially attentive. And God, even when people around us, perhaps they, they don't see the things that give evidence to your hand moving, may we speak of you to them in a way, Lord, that demonstrates love so that they might know that you love them and that you have a plan for them. God, you are not just our God. You're not just a, a small provincial God. Lord, you, you, you made it clear. Lord, it's a great reminder from the book of Joel. You're the God of all nations. You're the God of all people. May we remember that and never forget it. We love you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.